Good morning. Today is Saturday, the 14th of November, and on this day we celebrate the consecration of Samuel Seabury, who's the first Anglican bishop in North America, 1784. Let us begin our morning worship with a, the opening sentence from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people uh, to worship him. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. O come, let us adore him. The psalm is a portion of Psalm 37, verses 1 through 18. Fret not yourself because of the ungodly, neither be envious of those who are evildoers, for they shall soon be dried up like the grass, and be withered even as the green herb. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and surely you shall be fed. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you your heart's desire. Commit your way unto the Lord and put your trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall make your righteousness as clear as the light and your just dealing as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not grieve yourself over the one whose way prospers, over the one who carries out evil counsels. Refrain from wrath and let go of anger. Fret not yourself, lest you be moved to do evil. For evildoers shall be rooted out, but those who wait patiently for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the ungodly shall be clean gone. You shall look for their place, and they shall not be there. But the meek-spirited shall possess the land, and shall be refreshed with an abundance of peace. The ungodly plot against the just, and gnash at them with their teeth. The Lord shall laugh at them in scorn, for he sees that their day is coming. The ungodly have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy to slay those who walk aright. Their sword shall go through their own heart 
and their bow shall be broken. The little that the righteous has is better than the great riches of the ungodly. For the arms of the ungodly shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the godly, and their inheritance shall endure forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our lesson today is a continuation of the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, uh, chapter 15, verses 22 through 35. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and trouble you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have, sent, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle is the Song of the Redeemed. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you, because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, come. Fill our hearts in one accord to always, constantly, seek your will. Your will as it has been revealed in the Holy Scriptures and in the words of Jesus. Your will has been revealed and interpreted through the ages, through the church, always under the authority of the Holy Scriptures. Your will as we seek to discern what you would have us do today with the knowledge that even if we misread or misinterpret your will, we can always assess, stop, regroup and come to one accord and seek again to do your will in a different way, in a different direction, if we have misread it. That your grace is greater than our brokenness. May we always trust in you. May we always seek your will and your way and your truth. And may we, in the essentials of 
the faith remain true without wavering on those non-essential things, may we seek humble unity. We ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Jerusalem Compromise. Now, that's the way one can refer to this letter. Uh, we talked about it yesterday when we looked at the actual gathering of the council and then uh, that decision, the decision rendered uh, under the authority of uh, James, the brother of our Lord, and as we think of him as the first bishop of Jerusalem, uh, that this verdict that he rendered was put into writing and into a letter, and that's what we have today, that letter being transmitted and of course we have more than that going on, but that's the essentials. And so if you look at verse 29 of uh, chapter 15, you get the requirements that were written down and dispersed uh, to the Gentiles in Antioch and beyond. And uh, that I want to spend a moment uh, actually looking uh, and quoting from you from my study Bible. Again, I always encourage us to have study Bibles because they help us think about things from a different angle uh, and they are, they are not the Bible. We can disagree with the study notes, but I think they get us started and generally in the right direction. So I want to read a quotation uh, actually regarding the discussion in the council, verses 19 through 21, where James renders his judgment that we read about in the letter at, at verse 29. James's judgment was that Gentile believers did not have to be circumcised, but that they should stay away from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, a common form of idol worship, and from eating meat of strangled animals and from consuming blood, reflecting the biblical teaching that life is in the blood. See Leviticus 17:14. If Gentile Christians would abstain from these practices, they would please God and get along better with their Jewish brothers and sisters of Christ. Of course, other actions were inappropriate for believers, but the Jews were especially concerned about these four. This compromise helped the church grow unhindered by cultural differences of Jews and Gentiles, when we share our message across cultural and economic boundaries, we must be sure that the requirements for faith are those that are set up by God and not by people. The, I continue now with a footnote on verse 31. The debate over circumcision could have split the church but Paul, Barnabas, and the Jews in Antioch made the right decision. They sought counsel from the church leaders and from God's word. Our differences should be settled the same way, by seeking wise counsel and abiding by the decisions. Don't let disagreements divide you from other believers. Third-party assistance is a sound method for solving problems and preserving unity. Think about, whoops, think about that for a second. In our own lives, have we not said, in one way or another, I want it my way. It's my way or the highway. Well, if you don't agree, you can just leave. Have we not said that ourselves at times? I want it my way? There's the, it would be comical, except it's a sad uh, occurrence. It happens often at older folks and funerals. Of course, I'm slowly getting older myself, uh, but uh, folks will sometimes say, I'd like to hear Frank Sinatra's, I did it my way. Is that really, you know, what we should be seeking to do it our way? to get our way, to point the door to anybody who disagrees? Or should we seek the humble compromise? Now that word has fallen, especially in American politics over the last several years, into high disfavor. And it's been fueled 
by, in a strange way, by people who want it their way and only their way, so help them, demanding choices, either black or white, my way or the highway, and yet our whole system of government, our whole way of reacting with other human beings is based on compromise. The humble compromise. We cannot function in society without doing that. I suggest, well, maybe I don't, but I'm going to use this as an illustration. Don't do it. Four-way stop signs have become somewhat popular. I'm a big fan of the roundabout for what it's worth, but four-way stop signs are pretty popular. Now, everybody is supposed to come to a stop, but if we all took the the position of, hey, I want my way, and just go through the intersection without following the rules of yielding, I would put yielding in the form of compromise, an organized compromise, then four-way stop signs are going to do nothing but create four-way accidents, which they're not accidents at all in that case. They're actually intentional action of harm. Compromise. What do I mean by that? Well, I don't mean giving away or yielding, yielding on core values of belief. Not in the least bit. Core values of belief are essential. Otherwise, you lose the very essence of who you are. I use the illustration sometimes that I, uh, I love ice cream and uh, you go to um, one of the ice cream shops and you want your favorite ice cream. Let's say vanilla. Well, someone says, well, well, why don't you, you know, we live in this multicultural society. I believe you should have a mashup. Well, you could try some of that. There are these mashups every now and then that can be somewhat flavorful. But I suggest that if you throw every one of the 31 flavors of ice cream together into one lot, mix it all up and serve it, you will no longer taste vanilla. You will lose that flavoring that actually is you're known for, that you're the lover of vanilla. But it won't exist anymore. It's been compromised to the point that it's no longer recognizable. So I'm not talking about compromise of core values. In fact, there's a quote, and it's funny, when I started researching this quote, it became rather in adventurous. It goes like this, and it's often, the quotation is often, often attributed to St. Augustine, which apparently is wrong. Nobody can find where he ever said it. So we're just going to deal with the quotes, not the authorship. The quote goes like this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, I'm not going to give you a paper, although I reviewed several in looking up this quotation. You're welcome to Google it. Some people go down the route of trying to figure out who said it and the circumstances in which it was said. Some people look at it within the debate of, did a Roman Catholic say it, and therefore it's the essentials of the faith somewhat? Or was it said by a Protestant? Or God forbid, somebody said, it was said by a heretic. And then there's another resource that says, we need to rethink this. Well, I actually think if you just set it aside and forget who said it, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity, I think regardless of the source, that's something to actually think about. It leads to an understanding of the essentials, we should have unity. If we can't, then what disunity we have, at least you know that I like my vanilla ice cream, even though your favorite is bubble gum. But, okay, but I'm unified in my belief and those who like vanilla that it should still exist. But in the non-essentials, we give way. We, we allow diversity. We allow, um, you know, and we see that sometimes in the church, um, that, that sort of Anglican statement, all may, 
some should, none must. Now that too is a statement that can be misread. Not everyone may. We say that, but it's not true. Uh, Holy Communion is to be consumed by the believers in Jesus. <laughs> Those who actually would benefit from receiving communion, that they wish to be in communion with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, with each other, and they understand that something miraculous is happening when they receive communion. That's a, that's a, not everyone, if you're not a Christian, if you're not baptized, then certainly come and join us, certainly participate up to the communion, and at communion, uh, ask for a, a blessing. But why on earth would you receive the body and blood of Christ if you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe in the body and blood of Christ? You, you see, but my point is, uh, before we go off on a rabbit trail, I think there's something to be said about the essentials in unity. Therefore, we don't compromise those. Non-essentials, we give liberty and grace, recognizing diversity, and all things charity, that we seek um, harmony with people, not disharmony. We don't kill people we disagree with. Now, because this passage has been abused sometimes, some people would say, well, then give way to compromise on everything. Why can't we just, why can't we just agree to disagree? We can agree that we disagree, absolutely. But when we are part of a body that disagrees on the essentials, we're no longer part of a body. We need to recognize that reality, that when the essentials disintegrate, the body has disintegrated. We can still exercise charity. We can still say, you go your way, I'll go mine. But bear in mind, that gets us back to, I want my way. I want the, it's my way or the highway. Uh, you can just leave. We, you, you see, and here's what I want to get to. Move beyond the quotations because they sound great at first and they can offer something to ponder. But if you really, really, really want to see how to get along with each other, then you're not going to find that answer in a quotation. You're going to find that answer in the life of Jesus Christ. And so once again, you need to look to Jesus on how are we supposed to get along. And what I think you will see is the humble compromise in quotations. What I mean is Jesus was given the opportunity to compromise away who he is. Satan offered him a shortcut. He was offered himself a shortcut. You, you can, it was said to him, you can avoid the cross. And we know from the gar his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that indeed he did want to avoid the suffering. But at the end, what did he say? Not my will, not my way, but your will, O Lord, your way. We see a gracious humility, not compromising at all his integrity, the essentials, but offering his very life for those who gave him a way out, but it would not have given them a way out from the conviction of sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It's his real humility that even is greater than compromise. And so my friends, as I wrap up, as we think about the Jerusalem compromise, this letter, and as we look for the reading, sadly, we'll miss it tomorrow, uh, but it's kind of important because what happens is uh, Paul and Barnabas have a falling out over John Mark. They divide. There's no unity. <laughs> one goes one way, one goes the other way. But here's the thing. God uses what would have been a team going in one place to another place. That team now splits. And now you have two teams going out, sharing the same message. So even in our divisions, that is physical divisions, if we keep the message the same. This is the great wisdom, I think, of C.S. Lewis in mere Christianity. 
He recognized Roman Catholics, Baptists, Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, the whole gamut. And he emphasized, let's focus on the essentials, the mere Christianity. That word has changed meanings over time. But let's focus on the essentials and let's give, let's not worry about the things that divide us. They're real. Lewis was an Anglican. You were not going to get him to be something else. But he didn't allow his Anglican identity to trump his Christianity. When you and I come to make important decisions, and we always do, let it be informed by the compromise, the humble compromise, not by a wonderful quotation, not by a, um, a sentimental reflection of why can't we just all get along? Of course we all want to get along, but we still have legitimate disagreements. Let it be your decisions be informed by the decisions of Jesus, by his life choices, his examples. The compromise of Jesus is real humility, which is greater than mere or just compromise. And it is far greater than I want it my way, my way or the highway, where you can just leave. God bless you. Let's continue now with something that is unifying and I would argue very strongly an essential element of who we are as Christians, not Anglicans, but as Christians. You may not say the Apostles' Creed every day. You may never say it as part of your liturgy. It's not found per se in the Bible as a quotation with a chapter and verse, but you will find it is the biblical truth organized in such a way that we will have clarity and, and, um, and, an, and an identity that is biblical. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So be it. Every one of those statements is a biblical truth, and therefore it is essential, organized, to give us clarity on what I believe, what you believe. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And again, something that unifies us, unifies us in Jesus, who gave us this prayer, to the Father, who Jesus always sought the Father's will. Remember in Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done, our Lord Jesus said in praying to the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, 
and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The colic from this past Sunday. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may both be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I mentioned at the beginning of morning prayer that we also celebrate the consecration of Samuel Seabury, the first Anglican bishop in North America, uh, 1784. I want to share something that has always struck me about the story of this first Anglican bishop in North America. Uh, 1784, the United States has separated from uh, the Church of uh, has separated from England. The Anglican Church, the has separated and, and is now there's an independent Anglican church or the, the beginnings of an independent Anglican church in America, United States, and Seabury is our first uh, bishop. Consecrated in Aberdeen, Scotland, on November 14th, 1784. And here's what I find wonderfully fascinating. He was consecrated in Scotland on the condition that he, Samuel Seabury, study the Scottish rite of Holy Communion and work for its adoption rather than the English rite of 1662. And to the present day, the American liturgy adheres to the main features of the Scottish rite in one of its Holy Eucharist liturgies. It's a gentleman's agreement. There was no way to sue Samuel Seabury if he reneged. There was no way to force him to do it. He could have. He could have been a shrewd politician. I've dealt with this before in my personal life, where a person makes a commitment and says, I firmly commit to, and then it seems like no sooner than they get to the other side of the pond that you hear, well, now the situation has changed. No longer can I do that. Something, something is different. And that can happen at times. But I've also seen it as a shrewd political move where promises are made with the promise, with the idea, I'm saying this now and I'm just going to break it later. Samuel Seabury made a promise and the church in North America has followed that promise ever since. The 1662 Book of Common Prayer is authoritative, but we read it through the lens also of the Scottish rite on the Eucharist. That's why we have what's called an epiclesis, calling down the Holy Spirit. That's missing in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. Now I say missing in direct words. There's a strong argument that follows the orthodox uh, argument that the entire liturgy is a expectation and prayer for the Holy Spirit to come. But in the Scottish rite, it's written down and very specific. This is the colic for the consecration of Samuel Seabury. O God, our Heavenly Father, you raised up your faithful servant, Samuel Seabury, to be a bishop and pastor in your church and to feed your flock. Give abundantly to all pastors the gifts of your Holy Spirit, that they may minister in your household as true servants of Christ and stewards of your divine mysteries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And on Saturdays, our prayer is for Sabbath rest, whether it be on Saturdays, on Sundays. The point being, don't be controlled by the date, <laughs> but make sure that you take a rest. Remember the breath mark teaching from yesterday, from Fred Rogers? You need to take a break. But you can't be selfish. Your family, your spouse, your children, you need those who work for you. They also need to be able to take a break. Don't try to run the ship 24 seven in such a way that no one gets their, their seventh day off. We are people
people. We are humans. We need this break. God gave it to us. Let no man take it away. Almighty God, who after the creation of the world rested from all your works and sanctified a day of rest for all your creatures, grant that we, putting away all earthly anxieties, may be duly prepared for the service of your sanctuary, and that our rest here upon earth may be a preparation for the eternal rest promised to your people in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now that wonderful prayer for our common mission, for your mission and my mission to share the good news of Jesus. Look to the examples from the Acts of the Apostles. To share the good news of Jesus with all the peoples of the world, those near and those far off, those that we love dearly and those that we don't love dearly, but we still love them through the lens, through the commandments of our Lord. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and you sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite your prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings as the Holy Spirit leads you. Please join with me now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. We pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Words of wisdom now from Fred Rogers. No matter how old you are, we need to know that people who are important to us really do care about us. But feeling good about who we are doesn't come just from people telling us they like us. It comes also from inside of us, knowing when we've done something helpful or when we have worked hard to learn something difficult, or when we've stopped just when we were about to do something we shouldn't, or when we've been especially kind to someone else. 
Along these times, we're feeling good about who we are. We can expect and experience times when we're feeling bad about who we are. That's just a part of being human beings. When you're feeling good about who you are, reflect on how that's a gift of grace from God. When you're being challenged on where you're bad or things are not going well or you're making wrong decisions, know that's why Jesus came. He came to show us a different way. We do not have to only look within ourselves. We do not or should not get on a treadmill by ourselves to try to generate all things. We need to rest in Him and trust in Him and trust in His Word and trust in that relationship with Jesus. Nothing you have ever done, nothing you ever will do, will separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. He died, as he said, not just for the righteous, but for sinners. And St. Paul said, and I'm the worst. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. As you seek his will, sometimes you'll get it right. Sometimes you'll choose wrongly, or frankly, it just won't go consistent with what God ultimately wants in his plan. But you know this, God loves you. And even our mistakes, again, think of the reading for tomorrow, even our errors, even our disagreements, even our persecutions, God can use for his greater good, even our suffering. Will we look for that? Will we cry out to him in pain and yet yield? And at the same time, not be satisfied with social injustice or any other injustice and seek the welfare of all human beings, ourselves included? But with that humble, compromised humility of Christ. Not my way, O Lord, and not my will, O Lord, but thy will be done. I wish you all a wonderful worship tomorrow as you gather, as we gather um, for worship on Sunday. And I look forward to being again with you online for morning prayer on Monday, God willing. And as we say, the creek don't rise. Have a blessed day and join us for worship if you can tomorrow online or in person or at the church, the gathering of the body of Christ of your choosing. If you're Baptist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Roman Catholic, at the church of your choosing. May we be unified on the essentials. Jesus is Lord. He died so that you and I, that anyone who trusts in him can have eternal life. God bless you, my friends.